the special thing about the Altani collection, truly, is its broad expanse. It starts in the 16th century up till the present day. There are other collections of Indian jewelry, but nothing that has this broad approach nor this breadth of holding. The exhibition that we're hosting here in Paris is larger in terms of scale and scope, much more ambitious than any of the previous shows. Uh, not only in the volume of the room, the number of the works exposed, but also in the mise-en-scene. We wanted to create an exhibition whose design was somewhat dreamy and ethereal, that was romantic, was magical, but at the same time contemporary. The Altani collection allows us to really see the evolution of uh, taste, technique, fashion, style and technology in Indian jewellery from the Mughal period until the present day. We start with uh, royal dynastic jewels, explaining the importance of gemstones in imperial and royal Indian culture. We then move into a treasury, where we see a superb collection of historic diamonds and historic emeralds. And then, of course, we come into the age of uh, cultural encounter, the story of Cartier, La Cloche Frère, Melario, and the Maharajas. We close the exhibition by looking at contemporary jewelers who are inspired by India or who use Indian motifs or historic Indian stones. So this brings us to the present day. A ruler was very, very richly adorned. He was almost dressed like a divinity. Of course, above all, it's the turban ornament. These might be chains of pearls or diamonds. Normally, there's a type of aigrette, which is influenced by the shape of a feather. Necklaces, multiple necklaces very often. Armbands, an upper armband called a bazuband, a jeweled belt, and of course, Inside the uh, sash or belt, there would often be a jeweled dagger. We must remember in India, people did not wear jewelry just for adornment. The jewelry itself had a purpose and had a meaning, and the gemstones had particularly a cosmic significance. One would wear a particular stone to improve one's horoscope, one's fortune, one's health, one's happiness. Because of the emphasis placed on jewelry, the craftsmen of India developed various very special ways of handling gold. This opened up a world of creativity whereby gems could be put directly into the gold and the profusion of gems is something we associate with Indian jewelry. The mixture of colors, the richness of the yellow of the gold. And then of course another technique we associate a lot with India is enamel work. Enamel is used very widely even if it's not seen because sometimes it's applied on the back of a piece of jewelry to enhance its beauty and to give a, a delight and a pleasure to the wearer. May not be seen by the public, but it's seen by the wearer. So the whole approach was rather different. And what is interesting is when Europeans go to India and they see the jewelry there, they become infected by this very different aesthetic, by the very different technique, and also by the different way of wearing jewelry. Because we have to remember that in India, the great jewels were worn by men. It is not so often today that you will see an Indian man richly dressed with jewels, but the culture of jewelry, the belief in the adornment of the body with jewelry is present and alive in India. Indian women, even if they are not rich women, are always wearing bangles and rings and bracelets. If they do not have those, they wear flowers, which is really the original inspiration for some of the jewelry forms, comes out of nature. The subject of Indian jewelry is um, in, to some people, they may see it as a niche subject or something that's quite narrow. But I think when we think of India in many senses, we think of the richness of the jewelry. And the opportunity here in the Grand Palais until the 5th of June is for people to really come and see the finest Indian jewels, the fineness of the technique and the technology, the distinctiveness of the taste, and above all, how jewelry is a reflection of culture.